Hello everyone, and welcome back. Today we are going to talk about the singular homology groups of a topological space. These are groups that we'll show are homotopy equivalents invariants of a topological space, and they're very similar to the simplicial homology groups, but they happen to be a little bit easier to work with in abstract cases. We're also going to talk about some general uh, homological algebra. Homological algebra, as it sounds, is algebra that grew out of homology computations. This kind of mathematical reasoning is now basically in every area of mathematics. You're going to use some sort of homological algebra. So this will be a nice general toolkit for you to use. So let's get to it. Remember that last time we defined these delta complexes, which were simplicial decompositions of spaces. So on the right here, I have a nice little decomposition of the torus into these two triangles, one in the top left and one in the bottom right. And we define the singular, uh, sorry, the simplicial chain groups to be the free abelian groups generated by these simplices. And we also had this nice little boundary map where I form this alternating sum where I omit one of the vertices in an n simplex and uh, and I sort of keep track of, of the orientations by this negative one to the i. And this is some sum of n minus one simplices, and so it is an n minus one chain. And these maps had this very nice property, which is that if I ever did two of them in a row, delta n followed by delta n minus one, uh, I got zero. This is actually a very common algebraic setup. It's a setup called a chain complex. So here's the definition. A chain complex of abelian groups is a collection of abelian groups, and they come in this sequence, cn plus one to cn to cn minus one, all together with these maps. And it needs to have the property that if I do two of the maps in a row, I get zero. So, so we showed that the uh, simplicial homology groups form this chain complex. But again, this is a very general object and there are chain complexes associated to all sorts of mathematical objects. So here's the, the best thing about a chain complex. In a chain complex, the image of this boundary I plus one map is contained in the kernel of the boundary I map, right? This is exactly the statement that doing two boundary maps in a row is zero. But it might not be the entire kernel. So given a chain complex, we define the homology groups to be the kernel of the boundary map modulo the image of the boundary map coming into that group. So this is, in some sense, a measure of the failure of the image to be equal to the kernel. Great, so we're going to have a very similar algebraic setup this time in singular homology. So let's start with a definition. A singular n simplex is a map sigma from delta n to x. So this is very similar to what we saw before, except I'm not asking anything about this map except that it be continuous. When we defined a simplicial complex, we needed injectivity in some places and some other conditions. Here, the singular word means uh, it's in the sense of singularities. Like, the n simplex could be all folded up on itself, and I don't care. Now, just like before, I'll let cn of x be the free abelian group generated. 
by all of these maps. And we call elements of C and of X. Okay, so let me just be a little more precise. All these maps from, in particular, the N simplex into my space. Uh, so we call elements of C and of X singular N chains. And sometimes, if I, if I just say an N chain, I'll always mean a singular N chain. This is sort of the default homology theory. Uh, now, we have the same boundary map as before, which on a basis is defined by this alternating sum. The boundary of the n simplex map is the summation as i goes from 0 to n of minus 1 to the i v0 omit vi, so vi hat, up to vn. And the same proof as before, shows that delta squared is equal to zero. Now, before I go any farther, I just want you to realize how enormously big C n of x is. I'm just looking at all continuous maps from an n simplex. So basically, if my, if my set is non-empty, I'm going to have if, for example, I have a non-empty CW complex, then all of these groups are going to be uncountably generated. You know, two maps are different if they just disagree on a single point. So there are so, so many maps here. So it happens to be like some happy miracle that these groups end up being reasonable to work with. Uh, so since we get delta squared equals zero, we get a chain complex, Cn plus 1 to Cn to Cn minus 1, uh, which you know, can go on forever. And so here's the definition. The singular homology groups of a space X are defined to be okay, H N of X. If I don't write any decorations on the H, it means I'm talking about singular homology given by the kernel of uh, boundary N mod image of boundary n plus 1, where cn is hit by cn plus 1, goes to cn minus 1. So I have this boundary n map, and I have this boundary n plus 1 map. And this is the group of singular uh, n chains on X. So these CNs are all of the maps of n simplices into my space, and I can do this homology thing with them. So let me give you an idea of why this might be easier to work with. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna prove this theorem in detail later, but first I want to give you the idea. Here's a nice little lemma: if x and y are homeomorphic, then 
hn of x is equal to hn of y for all n. And here's the proof idea. Well, if sigma from delta n to x is an n chain, and f from x to y is a homeomorphism, then if I first do sigma and then I do f, I get a map from the n chain uh, that I started with, from the n simplex into y. So this is a singular n chain on uh, y. And we'll prove in some sense that the boundary of f composed with sigma is equal to f composed with the boundary of sigma. So all elements in kernel slash image go to kernel slash image. And that's basically it. If I do any computation in X, then after composing with the homeomorphism, I can do the same computation in Y. And the inverse homeomorphism, F inverse, tells me that any computation, I, any homology computation I do in Y is going to come back and be a homology computation in X. So I just wanted to write this idea down to contrast it with simplicial homology. The problem we had with simplicial homology is that it's very difficult to show that it's an invariant of the underlying topological space and not just an invariant of how we cut the space up into simplices. In particular, if I just took a homeomorphism between X and Y, there's no reason it would send a simplicial decomposition of X to a simplicial decomposition of Y. And generically, if I just picked a random homeomorphism, it wouldn't do that. However, once we expand the world to just include all singular maps in, then this homeomorphism lets me uh, transport all of the maps from X to all of the maps on Y. So what does it mean to be equal in this group, right? So this sort of isn't very clear. In the fundamental group, two loops were equal if they were homotopic, right? So here's, I'll write down the obvious definition and then I'll interpret it. If I have two elements in the group of n chains on X, I'll call them homologous if A is equal to B in the nth homology group of X. Now, this isn't sort of helpful, it's sort of the obvious thing, but note that A is equal to B if and only if A minus B is equal to zero in the nth homology group. Now, what does that mean? Well, A minus B is equal to zero in the kernel of this map mod the image of n minus ones, uh, like n minus uh, n plus one chains, and so a minus b is in the image of boundary n plus one. Now the way to interpret this is that a and b are the boundary of some n plus one dimensional object. So for example. Here are two curves on the torus, A, which I'll orient this way, and B, which I will orient the other way, 
And uh, A and B are homologous because there's this annulus between them. So since A and B co-bound, oh, uh, sorry, I actually should really make these go the same way. Yes, small detail. You know, since A and B co-bound an annulus, which is like an n plus one dimensional object, they are homologous. Great. So uh, let's get into some more general properties of singular homology. Well, here's a natural question. Are there values of n for which I can understand very concretely what hn of x is? Well, this answers the question partially, at least, for h0 of x. If x is path-connected, then h0 of x is isomorphic to the integers. And before I go into the proof, I'll just give you the idea. Well, here's my space x. It's path connected. And I claim that the zeroth homology is isomorphic to the integers. In other words, uh, remember that h0 is the uh, kernel of boundary 0 mod the image of boundary 1. Now, the kernel of boundary 0, there, there is no negative 1, uh, like, ch there's no negative 1 chains. So this is just the 0 map. So this is all of C0. So this is zero chains mod the image of boundary one. And what are zero chains? They're maps of the zero simplex. In other words, it's sort of integer multiples of points in my space. So I could pick out my space and I have two points and I could say, I want three times this point plus two times this point, and that's some zero chain. And I want to know which ones aren't the boundaries of a one simplex. So this, for example, is just one point is not a boundary. And I can take an integer times that point. So that's sort of going to be my generator. But now suppose I have some other point out here. Well. The space is path connected. A one simplex is a line, so I can map a one simplex in, connecting the two points. And these two points are a boundary. So the two points are homologous to each other. So everything is homologous to that one point, essentially. Now let's, let's just uh, write down the proof so that we can see how you'd actually honestly prove things using homology. So, now, define a map from zero chains into the integers by uh, epsilon of the sum over i of n i sigma i is the sum over the i's of n i's. So I just 
add together the coefficients of the points, right? Now, this is surjective, clearly. If I just pick one point, x0, and I want to hit 5, then I could take 5x0, and it maps over to 5, right? So we need to see what the kernel is. We claim that the kernel of epsilon is equal to exactly the image of this boundary 1 map. All right, let's do it in two inclusions. First, I claim that the image of boundary 1 is a subset of the kernel. Well, let me just take an arbitrary 1 chain. That's the sum over i's of ni sigma i. I'll just put a 1 on top of them to uh, remind you that they're 1 chains. Then what's epsilon of the boundary of C1? Well, this is uh, epsilon of, OK, so the boundary of a 1 simplex is the terminal vertex minus the initial vertex with the same coefficients. And so this is the summation as i goes from uh, summation over i of n i v 1 i. So this is like the terminal vertex of, yeah, let me call this v 0 i, minus the sum over i of n i v i, oh yeah, yeah, ah, sorry about that. Okay, this is the terminal vertex of uh, sigma i1, and this is the initial vertex. Okay, now what does my epsilon map do? My epsilon map adds together all the coefficients. So I ignore all everything, all the v's. So this is a summation over i of ni minus the summation of i over ni, which is 0. So what did I show? I took something in the image, and I took epsilon of it, and I got 0. And so the image is contained in the kernel of epsilon. Great. That's the easier direction. So this one isn't too bad either. I also claim that the kernel of epsilon is in the image of uh, this boundary 1 map. Right now, if C0, I have some 0 chain, that's summation over i, and i, and I'll just call, instead of 0 chains, I'll identify that with the point that it maps to. The summation of ni xi uh, has epsilon of C0 being 0. What does this mean? Well, that means the summation over i's of ni's is 0. And here's where we use the path connected part. Since x is path connected, we can fix a base point B and take paths from B to each xi which we'll call these paths tau i. Now I'm going to define a one chain let C1 be the summation over i of ni tau i. Now, what is the boundary of C1? Well, again, 
I had my points here like x0, x1, x2, and I fixed the base point here and I took maps of one simplices, aka paths, which all started at b and ended in the xi's. So this is the summation over i of ni xi minus the summation over i of ni times the initial vertices of all these paths, but all of these paths start at b. So ni b. And now, since the summation over i of ni is equal to zero, that second term disappears. So the boundary of C1 is equal to the summation over i of ni xi. And there we have it. I took something in the kernel of epsilon, and I proved that there is some one chain whose boundary is that zero chain. Great. So the kernel of epsilon is the image of boundary one. And by the first isomorphism theorem, H0 of x is, well, it's defined to be the zero chains. Well, it's defined to be the kernel of the map, but that ends up being the zero chains mod the image of boundary one. But uh, we've shown we have a map from zero, C0 of x to Z whose kernel is the image of boundary one and we've proven the isomorphism claimed. Great. So the next thing I want to do is show you how uh, homology interacts with connected components. The fundamental group actually could never see connected components, but homology does. And here's the proposition. We're not going to prove it in full detail, but I'll give you the idea. So if x has path components, x1 to x1, xn, uh, let's call them xk, then the nth homology group of x breaks up as a direct sum of the nth homology groups of the xi. In other words, you can compute homology component by component. And here's the idea. Well, since the n simplex is connected, so is uh, a map from uh, the n simplex to x. So each map lies in one connected component. Also, if delta n is in xi, so is the boundary of delta n. So all the homology computations happen component by component. Uh, yeah, so I'll just summarize that by components don't interact. And so here's a nice little corollary of those previous two results. The zero homology group of a space is z to the k, where k is the number of connected components. And again, you can interpret this like picture-wise as well. If there are two components here, uh, any two points here are homologous. But for example, these like two red points are not homologous because you can't connect them by a path. Great. Uh, so one of the nicest features of the fundamental group was that it came with induced maps. So we could study not only topological spaces, but maps between topological spaces.
And a similar thing happens for homology groups. So if f from x to y is a map, like we mentioned before in this homeomorphism idea proof, we get a map which I'll call f sharp from n chains on x to n chains on y. On a basis, this is given by sigma, this is a map from the n simplex into x, uh, is sent to f composed with sigma from the n simplex to y. Uh, and of course you extend this linearly in the normal way. So if the summation over i n i sigma i is in c n of x, then f sharp, let's call this chain c, f sharpest of c is the summation over i of i and i f composed with sigma i. And now this is a chain in y. All right, so the first question we need to answer is, how does this interact with that boundary map? f sharp of the boundary of sigma, let's just write down what this is, it's f sharp of the summation over i of minus one to the i, of sigma restricted to v0, cut out vi to vn, but this is an n minus one chain, and we know how to define f sharp of an n minus one chain. It's the summation over i of minus one to the i of f sharp of each of these little basis elements on the inside, sigma restricted to v zero up to v i hat up to v n, and now, this is equal to just uh, the summation over i of minus 1 to the i of f composed with all of these. Sorry, okay. V0 up to VI hat up to VN. And you can see this is the boundary of F sharp of sigma. Uh, so you just look at look at F sharp of sigma, and that'll be some n chain in cn of x, and if you hit it with the boundary map, you get exactly this formula up there. The important thing, like the summary, is that boundary of f sharp is equal to f sharp of boundary. So we get a commutative diagram And this diagram looks like, okay, I have my n plus one chains. I can map those over with boundary n plus one to cn. Uh, this maps over to cn minus one. Continues on to the left forever and on to the right forever. And 
let's uh, specify that this is the n plus 1 chains in x. And these map down to the respective chains of y by this f sharp map, just literally compose every simplex with, uh, with f. Oh dear, it's a lot of writing, sorry. Cn minus one of y onwards. And what do I mean by a commutative diagram? I mean, you can take any path you want here and you will get the same map. So this is a general setup here. This is a definition inspired by this exact picture. If Cn together with boundary C and Dn together with boundary D are chain complexes, then a chain map is a... Okay, now there's two ways to think about it. You can either think of it as like a big map between the chain complexes, which respects each level, or you could define it as a collection of maps. So I'll put collection of maps, map maybe S, F from CN to DN. So it respects the level N uh, with, okay, let me write that down. F of CI is equal to DI and also this commuting with the boundary condition. F composed with boundary C is equal to boundary D composed with F. Now, this is sort of the, the, the most natural set of maps on chain complexes. Just like continuous maps are the most natural maps on topological spaces, these are the things that respect the structure of a chain complex. And one of the most important things that comes structurally out of a chain complex is the homology. So let's see that F plays nicely with this homology if it's a chain map. So here's the proposition. If F from C, boundary C, to D, boundary D, is a chain map, then F induces a map, F star, from the homology of C into the homology of D. So let's prove it. Essentially what I need to show here is that F plays nicely with images and kernels. So if C in N C N is a cycle. Remember this means that boundary of C is equal to zero. Then boundary of F of C, I want to show that this is also a cycle. Well, this is F of boundary of C. This is the condition that F is a chain map. And so this is F of zero. And F is a map between like abelian groups, essentially, which means that F of zero needs to be zero. And so F of C is in the kernel of the boundary map in D.
let me just go put some decorations back on on this uh, equation here so we remember where we are. I can start with C. That's in n chains on in, in C. And then I can take F of it. That lands me in D. And then I can take boundary D. Or I could look at F of boundary C of C. And these need to be the same thing if F is a chain map. Great. Now I also need to make sure that uh, F respects boundaries. So similarly, if B in CN is a boundary with uh, boundary of A being equal to B, then F of B, well, this is F of boundary in C of A, but F is a chain map, so this is boundary D of F of A is also a boundary. So F of B is the boundary of something. Great. So now if I have some element of the nth homology, Hn of C. Well, Hn of C is the kernel of boundary N of C mod the image of boundary N plus 1 of C. So how do you represent things in a quotient? Well, it's represented as C, this is a cycle, plus B, which is a boundary, then I can define F of H to be equal to F of C plus F of B. And from what we just showed, this is in the kernel of boundary D because it was a cycle in boundary C. And this is in the image of boundary D in the n plus 1th level. And so this really is an element of the nth homology of D. And so we do honestly get a well-defined map in homology this way. Great. So that's going to do it for this class. Next class, we are going to analyze this setup in the event that F happens to come from a homotopy equivalence. And in that case, we'll show that F induces isomorphisms on homology, and we will show that singular homology is an honest invariant of our underlying topological space, and not just some something we've dressed up our space with. Looking forward to it, and I'll see you next time.